All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first 2023 uh, Biotech Connectors Speaker Series. Uh, this is the first one after a while that we are doing in person, or actually hybrid. Uh, therefore, I welcome the folks that are here in the room, and I also welcome folks that are online. My name is Vladimir Popo. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer here at the Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research. Uh, uh, just a little bit of background, Biotech Connector Speaker Series. This is a long-standing uh, collaboration with our uh, Frederick County Chamber of Commerce. This started years ago, and we have uh, done it even through COVID. We've had a number of successful events online, so we're slowly switching to, to in-person. So for those folks who are still online, would like to come in person, there's a great breakfast serve here in the background. So, and for those who are here as well, please help yourself to coffee and, and food. Uh, Frederick National Lab is a collaborative enterprise and we're always interested in partnering opportunities. We're also a national lab, therefore a national resource. So we like to share our unique expertise and capabilities. Uh, as well, we are one of the bigger employers here in Frederick. So we have about 2,400 people. Therefore, we have always open uh, open positions, so there are career opportunities. Please check them online. We have a great line of, lineup of speakers today. We're going to talk about next generation vaccine formulation and delivery, but just a few logistic, logistical things. Uh, we'll move through the speakers and we'll have time for questions after each speaker. So for uh, folks that are here, just please stand up and you can come up here and ask the questions. For folks online, you can either put your question in a chat box or you can unmute yourself during asking questions. Uh, please mute yourself or turn off the picture if you have a bandwidth issues so you can hear everything uninterruptedly. Uh, just a note, this meeting is being recorded for those who uh, want to watch it again or for those who miss it. Uh, now I have a pleasure of introducing Dr. Marina Dobrovolskaya. Uh, Marina is a lab director, or co-director, and the director of operations and the head of immunology section at Nanotechnology Characterization Lab, also known as NCL. Uh, in her role as the director of operations, Dr. Dobrovolskaya leads the NCL operations to provide preclinical nanoparticle characterization services to nanotechnology research community, uh, advance the translation of promising nanotechnology concepts from bench to clinic, and contribute to the education of the next generation of scientists in the field of preclinical development of nanotechnology-based products. Uh, the activities emphasize the NCL mission. She also directs the performance of immunology, client relations, and administrative sections of NCL. Closely integrated functioning of these sections play a critical role in advancing the NCL's key strategic goals and in supporting a mission in Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research. Uh, NCL is one of our most uh, outward facing uh, directorates, so we're very happy to, to have Marina today give you an introduction on NCL as well as Frederick National Lab and then also hear, hear from Steve. Uh, before I hand it off to, uh, to Marina, I just wanted to give special thanks to the folks who organized this, so the Chamber of Commerce and to Luba and Maggie who from Partnership Development Office here at the Frederick National Lab. They've, uh, put a lot of work into, into this, and uh, we are doing this quarterly from here on, so we'll always offer a hybrid version of this event, uh, but we hope to get more people here to, um, to just network and to listen to some great science. So, Marina? Uh, thank you, Vladimir, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here, and uh, to give this opening uh, presentation. Um, as Vladimir mentioned, uh, the theme for today's event is next generation vaccine formulation and delivery. And uh, before we go into uh, more specific scientific themes, I would like to briefly introduce Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research, or FNLCR for short, uh, led by two brilliant physician scientists, doctors uh, Ethan Dmitrovsky and Leonard Friedman. Uh, Frederick National Lab is funded by the National Cancer Institute 
and operated by LIDAS Biomedical Research. We are a team of 2,400 employees that provide uh, operations and technical support to the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of uh, Immunology and Infectious uh, Diseases. Within Frederick National Lab, we have several uh, national programs, and uh, I list them here on this slide. Uh, one of the programs is the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab that uh, I have a pleasure to co-lead with Dr. Stern, who is one of the speakers today. Uh, FNL is an extramural resource. We support extramural research community, uh, uh, whether it is big pharma, small biotech, uh, or you know, government and academia, everyone who develops nanotechnology, formulated diagnostics, therapeutics, or vaccine for cancer is eligible to have free characterization at the NCL. We have a comprehensive uh, assay cascade, which includes physical chemical characterization, in vitro and in vivo pharmacology and toxicology, and we assist our clients in their translational efforts. We help them with method development, nanoparticle characterization, as well as addressing some of the clinical, regulatory, and commercialization questions. Um, in addition to NCL, there are other national programs within FNL, such as National Cryo-Electron Microscopy Facility, HIV Research, RAS Initiative, Bioinformatics, and Data Sciences, and Vaccines Research and Development. And vaccines is the uh, main topic of today's uh, event. So let's uh, take a look in the history for a sample of next generation ideas from the past. Uh, in 1796, a British doctor, Edward Jenner, shown on this uh, uh, beautiful uh, lithograph, which I borrowed from uh, Harvard uh, website, uh, performed what's now known as the first world vaccination. So what he did was very simple. He didn't think about the fame. He didn't think about next generation ideas. He just used the opportunity to save a life of a child by uh, inoculating him with a pus from a cowpox lesion on a milkmaid's hand. And then he repeated this uh, inoculation six weeks later, this time using the material from a smallpox lesion. So boy's health was unaffected and the boy was protecting from contracting the infection that was causing a lot of suffering and death at that time, then he did it. And so that laid the foundation for the modern vaccinology. So almost 200 years it took uh, before the World Health uh, uh, Assembly officially declared that uh, the smallpox was uh, eradicated. So these days, uh, we, you know, many years later, we have uh, a lot of vaccines. Uh, here I list just uh, types of the modern vaccines and some examples. So uh, we use uh, inactivated vaccines, examples hepatitis A vaccine, life attenuated vaccines, example include measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, subunit recombinant polysaccharide and conjugate vaccines, example is Shigella, toxoid vaccines uh, such as Tdap. And the last two categories of vaccines, which I highlighted in different color and italic, represent a new generation of vaccines that became popular uh, during the uh, recent COVID uh, pandemic. So these include viral vector vaccines and messenger RNA vaccines from Janssen, uh, Moderna, and uh, Pfizer. Um, what we learned as a community from this new generation of vaccines that unlike traditional vaccines, they require a delivery. And so our speakers today will give you more examples of why the delivery is important and what challenges uh, uh, community faces with delivery. But uh, for my next introductory case study, um, I would like to use a collaborative study that we conducted with uh, Avidia Technologies, now Vaxitech, led by Dr. Jeff Lin. Uh, our collaborators at Avidia developed a, a polymer-based vaccine uh, that uh, uses TLR7-8 agonist as an adjuvant and uh, 
a mixture of peptide antigens that are personalized for each cancer patient. And so by incorporating this adjuvant and uh, peptides onto the polymeric platform, our collaborators showed that nanoparticle delivery platform improves antigen and adjuvant delivery to lymph nodes, recruitment of antigen-presenting cells, uptake of the formulation by APC, and as a result, improved responses of cytotoxic T lymphocytes. In the following study that was conducted by, by our team at the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab, uh, we found several interesting things, and here I show you a snapshot of the study that my team conducted looking at the cytokine, interferon, and chemokine responses. So the key findings are highlighted in this uh, gray box. First, we found that TLR7-8 agonist, when it is used by itself, is more potent and induces more cytokines. Once it is formulated in the nanotechnology platform, the degree, the level of the cytokines is reduced, which means an improved safety. So for those of you who work with TLR agonists know that these are very potent uh, immunostimulators, and more not always means better. So a lower immune response uh, uh, is safer in this case. Another important finding that came from the work at the NCL was that nanoparticle platform that is used to for delivery is not immunologically neutral. So the platform contributes to efficacy by inducing chemokines. So the key lesson learned from this study that each component of the nanoformulation has its role. Therefore, antigens, agonists, and carriers, once they put together in the formulation, have to be studied as a whole, and each of the components can be studied separately to understand the individual contribution. And with this, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming today's speakers. Uh, Dr. Stefan Stern is director of the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab. Uh, he leads pharmacology, toxicology uh, section at the NCL, and also he leads a formulation section. Uh, the title of his talk is The Future of Tissue-Targeted Lipid Nanoparticle Delivery. And our second speaker is from uh, AstraZeneca, Dr. Puni Tagi, uh, he's associate director with the dosage form design and development group at the AstraZeneca, and he will talk about drug delivery approaches for mRNA vaccines. So uh, good morning again to everyone, and welcome our speakers. Okay. Get going. Thank you very much for coming in today. You can all come forward if you like. <laughs> I've been officially declared not to bite anyone now. No, earlier it was, but not anymore. Okay. So, so what the the way we are going to work with this, and you know, we, I think the both the talks have been properly arranged. That I'll be going through some uh, overview of uh, lipid nanoparticles, and I'll talk about a couple of technologies that we are working at AstraZeneca that are not lipid nanoparticles. And uh, then uh, Steve will come in and uh, dig deeper into lipid nanoparticles. But before I just go into the, uh, to, the topic, just to see that, as we all know, right, immunization is primarily just trying to uh, look at some, some of the aspects of the, the microorganism that's causing the disease and using that to kind of generate an immune response against it. So just kind of stimulating our own immune, immune system to fight with the, uh, can, can you hear me when I go away from it? Okay, that's fine. I, I don't want to stick to this. Yes, so that's, that's, the, so that's the basic principle of immunization. And as uh, we were just being told that there are different kinds of uh, vaccines that are out there. When it comes to the virus by itself, there are three different types. There's a live attenuated vaccine, that's the, uh, smallpox, right? We were able to eradicate smallpox with this, and polio was eradicated to a good extent. Then we have the inactivated uh, vaccines. So the difference being that live attenuated is, is still the, the virulence has been decreased, and then inactivated, it's kind of been treated much further by heat and other methods, and 
uh, that's primarily the difference. And then recombinant virus vaccine, the, there was a mention about the Janssen vaccine. That's, that's the recombinant virus vaccine. But then other than that, there are many other such vaccines that are out there. Toxoids were mentioned, for example. And in case of a toxoid vaccine, we are not directly hitting on the microorganism, but we are looking at a toxin that the microorganism is releasing. And then we are fighting against that. And uh, then we have many of these uh, carbohydrate-based vaccines. Now, that's interesting. In 1950s, people were started working on carbohydrate-based vaccines. They were looking at the uh, the bacterial capsule polysaccharides, and they were using that to target the bacteria. But then, you know, antibiotics came in, and everybody just thought that we don't need vaccines anymore. For a couple of decades, there was no work on carbohydrate-based vaccines. In 1983, again, it picked up, and Merck had their first product. It was against... Uh, Pneumonia, pneumococcal infections. That's where the, uh, you know, the carbohydrate-based vaccines start became again. And uh, last but not the least, we have these nucleic acid-based vaccines that's primarily mRNA-based. That's uh, that's gained uh, prominence in the last few years, thanks to Mother Nature hitting us hard with COVID vaccine. COVID. So just giving you a brief background, when you're now specifically talking about uh, mR about nucleic acids, you know, right? So the nucleic acid starting right from the DNA, which serves as a, you know, it's the basic hardware. And uh, from there, uh, mRNA, the RNA, it serves as a software. It kind of picks up the uh, information from the DNA, and then it translates into a protein, which is more like a, a graphic user interface on a computer, right? That's what you see out there. That's the protein. And uh, this, the particular mRNA thing, the, the uh, ribonucleic acid, it's been honed over centuries, over, over thousands thousands of years, to kind of very accurately pick up the knowledge from DNA and then bring it to a, you know, an exact protein. Uh, but if you see, when you talk about mRNA as a therapeutic, at the first time the discovery of mRNA was in 1961. But then it took us a long time before we could get into human beings with that. And I have a star at the end which says 2017 when we first went into humans with an mRNA. And the reason primarily for that big gap was that it was thought to be, mRNAs were inherently thought to be uh, they were susceptible to degradation, and they were inherently unstable also. So that's why there was this huge gap that happened. But then recently, what happened with COVID, as you will see, this, this uh, I put a chart out here, this came out through the recent publication in Journal of Control Release. The first time we got the genetic sequence was in January of SARS. And then in February, Moderna was able to go into humans. So that was just a one-month period. So you just imagine what... Uh, <clears throat> Obviously, COVID wasn't a good thing, you know, I'm not praising it, but then how the pharmaceutical industry benefited from it, that we could push something that was on the back burner for a long time, we could bring it to the forefront and then uh, quickly turn it around and then uh, help people. Millions and millions of people got, uh, got vaccine by vaccination through these uh, vaccines through Moderna, and then the green one is the biotech Pfizer vaccine. And so working wonders for us, both these vaccines and obviously for for the pharmaceutical industry also, pushing us into a new generation. <clears throat> but then there are challenges to mRNA delivery, right? It wasn't that easy that we just picked up one day and started making mRNAs, mRNA formulations. As I was saying, they're, they're uh, prone to degradation. So it has to go through, is there a, I'm just looking for a cursor if I can find this one. So if you notice that, it's not as simple as just putting in an uh, mRNA, right? It's, it seems simple that you make an mRNA for any protein that you want to get expressed in the body, and then you just inject it. And then the our cells in our body will inherently just crank up the protein that we're looking for. It sounds very simple, but it's not. There are so many challenges, inherent challenges in mRNA, and some of them that have been listed here, you know, starting from, uh, first of all, when it's injected, you know, it has to uh, go through this blood circulation where it can be picked up by many of these, uh, you know, cleaning, cleaning cells and cleaning agents in the freely floating around. And then once it, it has to get into the cell to be active. So that's, an, again, a big challenge. And before that, even, you know, there are other uh, exonucleases, endonuclease that can degrade it. So there's a lot of degradation that happens. And those can be fixed by some modifications to mRNA. You know, you can make changes to the inherent degradation, the inherent susceptibility to degradation, you can change mRNA to that, right? For example, there's a poly-A tail that you could modify, you can cap it, and uh, also make it more uh, prone, uh, more, uh, you know, more robust and prevent it from degradation to exonucleases. 
And but then that itself is not enough for it. We need a, a delivery system for it. So when we talk of delivery of mRNA, right now, most of the delivery of mRNA, especially the two products, the Pfizer and the Moderna, has been with LNPs, that's lipid nanoparticles. But then those lipid nanoparticles have picked up from their predecessors, which are liposomes primarily. You know, liposomes have been around for a long, long time. Uh, from they have products in the market for a very long time. And uh, picking up from liposomes, we have come all the way up to lipid nanoparticles. And uh, what do lipid nanoparticles include are, they primarily have these different kind of lipids in them. So one is this uh, ionizable lipids. So the ionizable lipid, the job of ionizable lipids are to, uh, they bind with the mRNA, they condense the mRNA because lipids, those are of oppositely charged and they can condense our mRNA. And then once inside the cell, these ionizable lipids can help in helping the mRNA escape from the lipid nanoparticles. We have other lipids along with the, the ionizable lipid. There's PEG that uh, confers stability to the formulation. It prevents it, you know, it prevents it from being identified once once it's injected into the body. And then there's some, some helper lipids, for example, some um, some anionic phospholipids that can help give structure to the uh, to the uh, lipid nanoparticles. And uh, as I put down there, that there was this product that came back in 2018, Patisirin, that was with NSIRNA. So lipid nanoparticles were clinically validated uh, before we, the before COVID hit us. But then with COVID, we had uh, the biotech uh, uh, Pfizer, BioNTech Pfizer, and uh, the Moderna products coming out, both approved in 2020. So just to give you a brief uh, background as to how these, why do we need a cationic lipid, right? So. As I was saying, cationic lipids, yes, they do condense the mRNA, help it stay within the nanoparticle that's being formed. But then beyond that, once when they're inside the cell, what the, uh, what the uh, cationic lipids do is that when they're taken up by the endosome, right, that's the, that's the expected process to happen. Once the particle goes inside the cell, the endosomes engulf it. But then what the cationic lipid does is that the low pH of the endosome those cationic lipids become high in the charge density, and then they can interact with the ionic phospholipids of the endosomal membrane, and they can disrupt the membrane, and that leaves the that leaves the mRNA free for being translated into a protein in the cell cytoplasm. That's why these cationic lipids are very, very important. And uh, you know, there's tons and tons of patents around cationic lipids. They're trying to cover everything under the sun. Many of these some some companies that are specifically focusing on cationic lipids. Um, one of them is uh, put in there is a DL and DMA. That was something a long time ago. One of the earlier ones which is excellent in uh, acting as a cationic lipid and you know, helping mRNA reach the cells and then eventually in the cytoplasm. It was, it was developed uh, by Novartis many, many years ago. And many of these versions have come out. Many, many versions of these cationic lipids have come out as we, uh, as we move forward. So this was just a brief background about lipid nanoparticles. And I just wanted to give this before I show you about some other technologies, because this is right up in the, is a front runner for uh, vaccine delivery. But beyond lipid nanoparticles, there are many other such formulations that are being explored right now in the, in the industry. <clears throat> Starting from right from uh, inorganic particles, we have uh, silica particles. That's one of my favorites. I'll talk a bit about those. Then we have viruses. Uh, 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 FDA approved a product called Luxterna, which was for an ocular disease, a genetic ocular disease a few years ago. So virus particles have also been uh, been you know approved and being used, then exosomes came into the picture somewhere around early 2000s. You know when uh, a, a lab in uh, Harvard Medicine they kind of brought it out to the forefront that exosomes practically shuttle information from one cell to another, and so they they extracted those exosomes and you could load them with, uh, with active agents as you would like and then eventually use them for um, delivery purposes. Lipid polymer hybrids you know primarily learning from <clears throat> liposomes. But then liposomes had some some drawbacks to them. Uh, first, first one that it's uh, leaks; they, the the active can leak out of them because they don't have a very a robust um, outer surface. And also, <clears throat> they they were not they were not going to extend for a long. It didn't have a a long uh, how to say a sustained release in the body. It was a very quick release. So that's <clears throat> looking at some of those drawbacks of lipids. I'll just pick. So some of those drawbacks of <clears throat> lip <clears throat> liposomes, and then so some people thought that okay, let's incorporate some polymers along with it that can overcome the uh, the drawbacks of uh, liposomes. But then uh, 
still have their cap cap capability to deliver. Micro needles, another one of uh, my interests personally. Uh, there are a lot of companies out there, startups that are working on micro needles. I'll talk about this also a bit. Uh, DNA biomaterial is a fairly new uh, technology being used, you know, and uh, we could once again condense the and because it's it's biodegradable, it's 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 generate a huge immune response. So DNA biomaterials are also something we explored. Cationic polymers, they have been used for a long time. Many of you might have been using lipofectamine in your research, and that's one of the cationic polymers. Uh, PEI, polyethylenamine is one. And then we have direct delivery. You know, you could uh, you could just pass a, a, a kind of a, a current, and that could temporarily make cells permeable. I had a question with regard to the cationic polymers like uh, linear uh, PEI, PEI. Have any of those actually gone into the clinic? And if so, uh, was there any side effects, any issues with those? Um, you know? Surely they're toxic, right? Ketanic, they, they are, they're toxic in nature. So. Yes, so polyethylene means it. They build themselves as yeah. clinically translatable technology. Yes, they do build them. But I, even if they have, I'm sure they've been to the clinic, these cationic, uh, you know, like polyethylene, they've been around for a long, long time. But then there are toxicity challenges with anything so, so cationic in nature, like, like polyethylene. So to my knowledge, I don't think any of things has been approved for use in humans. But yes, clinic, uh, yes, they could have reached the clinic for sure. And uh, that's why, you know, the, as, as you're already aware, the lipid nanoparticles also, we use a cationic lipid, but then you kind of coat it with a, with a peg so that it, it kind of shells, it uh, covers the cationic nature temporarily of the cationic lipid. So yes, so by themselves, cationic lipids or polymers, they, they don't stand much of a big chance uh, by themselves. So these are some of the other technologies that are out there beyond lipid nanoparticles that are being used. And as I was saying, one of my interests are in silica particles. I've been working with silica particles for a long time, five, six years now. And the best thing I like about silica particles is that you can shape them in whatever way you want to. And that shape, you can use the, those physical properties of shape, size, uh, the porosity, all of those just to define the sustained release that you're looking for. What kind of a material do you want to load into? And many other such parameters. You can, so you can play around a lot with this. And I just put a, this paper that came out a few years ago that how they're showing that how just by changing the pH, they could change the size of the particle wave from 30 nanometers all the way up to 280 nanometer. And the pH has not, it's not like a huge change from T10.86 to 11.52. Similarly, pore diameter, you know, all the way from uh, three nanometers up to 15 nanometers, depending on the condition of the reaction. And you would think that, why would I need different pore sizes? It, it all boils down to what kind of an active you're trying to load into your particles. If you're trying to load an antibody, which is few nanometers in size, you would want a much bigger uh, pore size. And if you're looking at a small molecule, which is practically Armstrong's in size, you can easily go ahead with a three nanometer pore size. So depending on what active you want to load, how much of you want, it, you want to load, you can play around with the pore size as well as, you know, with the, with the size by itself of the particle. And then <clears throat> the best thing I like about silica is that, you know, silica is, is so abundantly uh, available in our body it's one of the most uh, common trace element in our body. You can find it in all the connective tissues, bone, everywhere. It's present everywhere. So silica is not a, it doesn't, it's expected, it's not expected to generate that huge an immune response when you use it as a delivery platform. And furthermore, silica, the technology that I've been working with, and there are many other such technologies, they're primarily aqueous based technologies. And so they don't use any harsh chemicals or solvents. And that is again a benefit when you're talking about uh, Actives such as antibodies, which are very, very prone to degradation in presence of solvents or high shears. So that's another important aspect of silica particles. And I'll just show you a couple of uh, case studies that we were looking at in the past. So this is a surface functionalized silica nanoparticle. So if you see that, there's a, a there was this fruit called rambutan. You know, I'm not sure. I, I haven't seen it in in uh, this country that, but I, I was in Malaysia many, many years ago, and that's a very commonly available fruit. What it looks like, it has these, you know, these hair on top of it. So what the company did, this is a, this was a, a something that was developed at the University of Queensland in uh, Australia, and then it was picked up by a company in UK. <clears throat> uh, I think it's called N4 Pharma. What they do is they make these silica particles. They are hollow, and but then they have these spikes on the surface. And they what they do is they can they can entrap nucleic acid in those in those spikes on the surface. 
and uh, they so and they can make different shapes different sizes and uh, i think there was a raspberry and uh, rambutan fruit and whatnot so they have different structures different sizes that they can create and then when they once they're injected those nucleic acids kind of disentangle and they are free to uh, free to act when once they're inside the cell the good thing was with with them that the the way the surface is is designed just because of the steric hindrance and so and so forth they the nucleuses are not able to enter those uh, that that part of the of the nanoparticles where and you know kind of degrade it so i just put a, a confocal image there that with and without treatment with the dnas there was no effect and we could still see a good response whereas in a a lipofectamine uh, formulation that was used there was a sharp fall in the transfection efficiency because uh, obviously because most of it most of the uh, the nucleic acid was degraded but whereas in this the formulation with this nanoparticle there wasn't a significant difference there was a very minimal difference and then uh, also when we injected into this into animals we see a uh, an increase in the efficiency of you know the <clears throat> the igg's that are being expressed but and it increased with the amount of nanoparticles we are injecting so the np ratio that i have in the graph below that just shows a ratio of 50 microgram of the nucleic acid with you know different different uh, amounts of the nanoparticle so np 10 20 and 30s that increase that indicates a increasing amount of nanoparticles that are uh, coming that are being injected along with the uh, with the nucleic acid and we see an increased response of it we've been we've been we worked on it with an mrna also Uh, but it didn't give us a as robust a response as we would see with the lipid nanoparticle we needed approximately three times more nanoparticles in comparison to a lipid nanoparticle to make it efficacious as as much of a lipid nanoparticle is so this is something a work in progress we still we're, we're still working on it and also exploring uh, similar such technologies that are away from the conventional lipid nanoparticles another one that we've looked at is a uh, fusogenic silica nanoparticle so what they do is they have these silica particles which are highly porous you can load them with the mrna or dna and then you coat them with lipids that are that help in uh, you know fusing of the nanoparticle with the cell surface cell membrane and that can include peg and there are other some uh, some lipids that help in this this uh, fusing of the cell of the nanoparticle with the cell membrane and they had some other uh, peptide not peptide sorry lipids that they were using once inside the cell the uh, mrna is free and the uh, silica nanoparticle just move away and in this picture below i've seen that how once inside the cell that these are nanoparticles whereas if you try to not coat it with those lipids fusogenic lipids they kind of are pinocytos so you can see that they are in a they're in a balloon kind of a structure but when they are injected with those fusogenic lipids they go in and they have these you can see them they are distributed across in the cytoplasm and uh, <clears throat> i have this animal study that i put in here this is for a this was against a staphylococcus they had this sirna it was against staphylococcus pneumoniae uh, bacteria and uh, we can see that clearly that with the fusogenic silica nanoparticles we saw a much better survival rate that's the blue line right here in the top here so and by avoiding endocytosis we could just completely avoid the the endosomal pathway which is taken up by when lipid nanoparticles are injected into the body <clears throat> i'm just conscious of time and i'm please let me know if i'm overrunning time and okay so the other one was micro needles that i mentioned about and uh, with micro needles what's the the good thing is that this picture as you can see if this is a, a cross section of our of our skin the micro needles they go somewhere up you know right here they are approximately a few hundred microns in size and then depending on the size how deep they go but then the the good thing is that in the topmost layer the epidermis we have tons of these dendritic cells called langerhans cells which are antigen presenting cells so when you uh, like right va vaccination the the basic concept is that antigen presenting cells they pick up antigens and then they go ahead and stimulate the t and b and t cells so the same purpose can be solved by using micro needles because right up on the epidermis there are tons of these these apcs the antigen presenting cells present there the the good thing about uh, micro needles is that what you would like to do is is use like why you would like to use micro needles is primarily because of the pain that comes along with injections 
right? And that's that's a major concern when it comes to patients who have to take injections regularly. You know, there are many such diseases that we have to inject every day. So for even from that perspective, you know, microneedles are a, an interesting prospect. And uh, I just put that there are three different types of microneedles that are used commonly. The first one is a hollow microneedle. It's made of a like you can say a metal or something of that sort, and then it would have a a pouch on, on top of it containing the, the the active solution in a liquid form, and then the patient would just press it, and the liquid flows through the the hollow micro needle, and then you just dispose of the patch. The liquid's been delivered. You can coat micro needles with your active ingredient, but that requires an extra step that you would have to either lyophilize your formulation, dry it in some form, and then the last one, the most attractive but also the most complicated is a dissolvable microneedle. And what it means is that you can make your uh, microneedles using a polymer, a biodegradable polymer. And once injected under the skin, then it slowly degrades and releases the active and over a period of time. <clears throat> so, but as I was saying, there are a lot of these barriers that have to be resolved to commercialize microneedles. And the first and the first foremost is the cost. Right? You're talking about a patch which requires a very, very sophisticated um, equipments to manufacture, and not a lot of them out there right now. So that's it. And so we, uh, you know, when we look at it from a commercial perspective, anything that goes beyond two, two and a half dollars uh, for each uh, each of them is something is, is a no for us. We cannot commercialize it because the cost becomes huge when you're talking about millions of such patches. So we are always trying to keep it low, one point five to two and a half dollars. That's the uh, that's where we would want it to be. And as I mentioned, this, you know. <clears throat> no fully commercial lines are currently available. So commercialization becomes a big thing. Whenever you want to take a microneedle to the clinic and commercialization, you need a full line set up for them, manufacturing. Consistent dosing is a big challenge with microneedles. And when I say consistent dosing, what it means is that if a patient is applying the formulation by himself or herself, the, the pressure they apply for the microneedles to get into, under the skin can be significantly different. And in some cases, not the the whole whole the, the entire set of microneedles might not go under the skin or to the depth we want it to be, and uh, so you know there are ways out of it. We could have uh, pressure sensors, probably some some kind of a pressure sensor on top of the patch, but then obviously it increases the cost of the product. Formulation challenges. I mentioned that there are different kind of uh, microneedles. Uh, you're talking about hollow ones that require the, the simple liquid formulation, but then there are those dissolvable microneedles where you, you have to think about the polymer concentration, you have to think about uh, the, the viscosity of the solution when you're going to lyophilize it, and, and whether there's a use of solvents or not. Many such, uh, such questions come into being in, in terms of formulation challenges. So <clears throat> the competitive landscape is very narrow. Uh, I just put in five of the companies that, that are out there, but then there might be a few. I'm, I'm not saying these are the only ones, but then these are kind of the four front runners. Uh, but then uh, there are challenges with respect to cost I mentioned, and then uh, some of these companies have exclusive licenses with, with other pharma companies that you know you cannot just work with, with them for some reason. And and uh, the the delivering age, the, the, the instrument being used, the, the device being used to deliver the the patch might be costly, and so on and so forth. There are many, many such reasons. So, so there's a very narrow landscape for it. We have a couple of technologies that we have looked at, and uh, we've been thinking about them. Out of the ones that I've mentioned, <clears throat> uh, Micron, this, the one that is on top here, this is a biodegradable, uh, dissolvable microneedle. It's made of uh, gelatin, and you can, you can, in, in, you know, while the gelatin is being solidified, you can introduce your active and that they have used it for influenza vaccine. And there's a phase one that they have completed. And the, the good thing is that they have looked at the patients themselves using it instead of a, a, a clinic, a, they have, instead of the patient coming to the clinic. It's been, a, there's a high dose delivery efficacy. You know, I've put it 75 to 96. It's high and it's better than others, but it's just some, you would desire something more 90% plus. Uh, more important thing is that it's stable, thermally stable. You know, they have a study done up to you know, two years where they have shown that the vaccine is stable in that in that gelatin formulation they have. The another company, this Vaxis, is of is of great interest to us. Is of great interest to us. This primarily because it's a sustained release. It provides sustained release. I was mentioning that if you could have something that could provide a sustained release, sustained efficacy of that 
immunization, you know, we always have a, a prime and then we boost when we give it. But then if you could have something that could be inbuilt within the same formulation that could be, that could reduce the number of clinic visits and also uh, more patient compliance. It, this is made of silicon fiber, silk. It's primarily a silk protein that's being used. And depending on the, the confirmation of the silk protein, you can have a sustained release with the, with the uh, formulation here. What they have shown, you know, surprisingly, that compared to a intramuscular injection, their the efficacy of the immunization was 1,300 fold higher, and they 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 uh, you know calculated that using the antibody titers that have been generated, and uh, they are so the the sustained release aspect is of 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 you know is is unique with this formulation, and you can see in the graph that. Uh, the sustained release effect continues over a period of, you know, day four. This is day 16 and beyond, whereas an intramuscular injection just uh, varies off. It just, it just dies out. So these are some of the other technologies I'm working on. And uh, in, in summary, just to let you know, and as I mentioned that uh, there are some health conditions that cannot be addressed by uh, traditional methods. So we have to look at new vaccination procedures. We have lipid nanoparticles coming in. And... Uh, the advantage of these vaccine and of lipid nanoparticles has been demonstrated by the recent pandemic. But then we need some some other vaccination processes uh, wherein you know you're talking about countries where the the cold chain cannot be maintained, for example, you would want to, you would want to have a a room temperature stable formulations. And uh, right now, lipid nanoparticles are haven't reached that level. But then, uh, you know, that's why we're exploring other aspects like micro needles that can be stable at 40 degrees for a long period of time. And then uh, dose pairing is, an, is a very good uh, attribute that micro needles present for us that you can significantly reduce the dose just because you're giving it right at the site, you know, you're giving it to the antigen presenting cells right away versus injecting it into the, the muscles or into the blood circulation. So that makes these other formulations as uh, more attractive alternatives and uh, so works ongoing on, on those technologies too. Thank you very much. This is, I think, my last slide. Yes, so any questions anybody would like to take? What do you think of dendrimers? Dendrimers are also used like uh, for delivery, drug delivery, and are they... Are they... they? They are used, yes. Dendrimers are used, but to my understanding, dendrimers have a similar challenge like you know lipid nano lipid uh, liposomes for example uh, the the last micro i saw this showed that they had a sustained release also and that really makes us very attractive and uh, dendrimers by themselves might have efficacy but if you could combine it with another formulation like you know lipid polymer nanoparticle for example that really makes it much much better but yes for sure dendrimers are being used also there were two questions in the chat okay sure and um, for anyone who asks that, feel free to unmute. Hope you can hear me, <laughs> or I can read it out. So one question was from Ian: Was what sort of regulatory challenges have you faced when trying to use micro needles in combination with various vaccine drug products administered in clinical trials to evaluate safety and potential? Well, I can surely. I mentioned one of them, which was the uh, the efficacy. If the efficacy is going to range from seventy-five to ninety-five percent. That might not be acceptable clinically, at least when it comes to the time of approval. You know, FDA would want a much tighter uh, a range. You know, ninety percent plus. That's also, I would say, you know, it's it's a, it's a stretch, a bit of a stretch. So that's one challenge that we get. Obviously, then when we come to micro needles, we're using these new polymers. FDA, even though some of these polymers have been around for a long time, but that's not the way FDA generally looks at. And that's again, to my understanding, I wouldn't say it. I'm not going to be. I'm not saying that FDA generally believes that, but my understanding is that FDA would look at all these new excipients, these new polymers. Uh, they'll see them as novel, and that would require to go back and look at, you know, toxicity issues with these. You know, there are so many other, so many toxicity studies that we have to do, and uh, so they would consider this as a novel excipient, even though the the excipient might have been used for a long time. That's a big challenge that comes in, and that automatically extends the half the the, the life of the, the research that we have to invest in before the product comes to the market, but also the cost. It increases everything exponentially. So those are the challenges we face when it, we look at you know, from an FDA perspective. Uh, you want to take the other one, or you want to move on to the? Uh, okay. Yep. Maybe we can do a follow up. Yeah, that's good. Methods are used to trap and tangle the plasma DNA molecules on the silica spikes of the silica nanoparticles. 
Uh, that's yeah. so. What analytical methods to study them? You mean, or what was that? Sorry. Well, to um, is the method simple as mixing? Oh yeah, it's just a simple process. You can just mix them. Basically. Yes, it's a physical mixture. Uh, then that that's that's eventually that leads to it. Obviously, you can improve upon it and improve the efficiency. But yeah, it's a standard process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so my uh, talk today is going to be the future of tissue-targeted lipid nanoparticle nucleic acid delivery. We've been in this area for quite a while, um, trying to target uh, various nanostructures, uh, nanoplatforms to specific uh, tissues as well as uh, cells within tissues. Um, as Marina said, my name is Stephen Stern. I'm co-director with her of the Nanotechnology Characterization Laboratory. So um, the current uh, marketed lipid nanoparticle-based nucleic acid therapeutics uh, are the mRNA vaccines, including Comirnaty uh, by BioNTech Pfizer, as well as the mRNA-1273 uh, by Moderna. Uh, both of these are passively targeted to lymph node uh, following intramuscular injection. And I'll go into basics as to how that occurs. For Ampatro, which is an entirely different beast. Uh, this is an siRNA uh, of transthyritin um, for hereditary amyloidosis. And in this case, they're targeting two hepatocytes in the liver, and they're doing this following IV injection. And this is a passive targeting in that they don't have a targeting ligand uh, on the onpatro uh, lipid nanoparticle, but it does undergo some um, association with proteins during the course of the transport to hepatocytes that leads to actually an active uptake process that I'm going to uh, touch on as well. But the beauty is, anyway, yeah, yeah, anyway. If, you could, um, yeah. if you could target LNPs uh, directly to tissues and even more particular uh, or specific uh, to cells within those tissues, it opens up... Um, new future applications for lipid nanoparticle technology. And just a couple of the ones that I thought on or that we've been working on are CRISPR-based gene editing for genetic disorders. I'm gonna go into a collaboration that we have with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute for sickle cell disease using uh, CRISPR LNP. Um, certainly in vivo CAR T therapy is now the rage and so uh, where normally CAR-T therapy is performed using um, autologous or allogeneic T cells that are modified and injected back into the patient, which makes it very expensive, almost prohibitively expensive. Um, this would allow for modification of the CAR-T cells in vivo um, through LNP technology and targeting of uh, cells that interact with CAR-T cells or the CAR-T cells themselves. Um, also, we're looking to improve um, mRNA and self-amplifying RNA vaccines, and this work is being done through CIPL uh, collaboration. I'm going to touch on that as well. And lastly, um, you know, siRNA and mRNA, siRNA and mRNA-based therapeutics have always had the potential to go after non-druggable, uh, non-hepatic target tissues, but for this non-druggable, non-hepatic target tissue application, of course, we need to be able to target the LNPs to the cells uh, and tissue types of interest. So um, this was touched on by our last speaker, but I, I'm going to go into a, just a bit more nuance. Um, so LNPs, as we know of them, um, they are a broad uh, group of uh, platforms, but most notable would be um, the ones composed of cationic lipids, again, ionizable um, at non-physiological pH um, or constant charge at physiological pH, structural and helper lipids such as phospholipids and cholesterol that can help um, uh, for the structure of the lipid nanoparticle, but also for release from endosome and stealth uh, pegylated lipids that provide um, a coating, a hydrophilic coating that prevent opsonization and rapid clearance of the LNP 
uh, to Cooper cell and other macrophage components of the polynuclear um, phagocytic system. Um, these uh, stealth pegylated lipids basically allow the LNP to move around the body before it gets to the site of the target tissue at which you want the interaction with the cell. Um, the formulation of lipid nanoparticle um, is primarily conducted nowadays in a scaled fashion by microfluidics. It's a very simple technique uh, in which you have the nucleic acids in the aqueous phase, they that would be at pH 4. You have lipids in the organic phase. Uh, you mix them together at a certain ratio and concentration uh, in the microfluidics device. Uh, this leads to ionization because of the low pH of the ionizable uh, lipid component which then condenses the negatively charged uh, nucleic acids, and voila, you have these nicely formed uh, lipid nanoparticles. Um, you then, however, want to remove that cationic charge, and you do this by dialysis at uh, pH 7.4 to a buffer swap into a physiological pH, pH 7.4 uh, um, uh, buffer. Uh, this uh, physiological buffer that neutralizes that cationic charge on the ionizable lipid, and this allows for a more biocompatible, less toxic formulation. One of the first things we realized when we were doing um, nanotechnology, uh, nanomedicine structure activity relationship studies was that generally cationic uh, nanoparticles were the most toxic, they had the most biological interactions, and so the development of ionizable lipid um, structures for these LNPs that were non-ionized at physiological pH was really the breakthrough that Peter Cullis uh, came about um, that allowed for the clinical translation of these nucleic acid LNPs. So that was a big discovery. So also, uh, as I said, we're members of the Nanotechnology Characterization Laboratory. And as such, um, one of our charters is to um, identify new methods and the proper methods of characterizing lipid nanoparticles. And so here you can see a summary of lipid and uh, lipid nanoparticle and liposome characterizations that we've identified through the years that we found to be important for uh, understanding um, their physical chemical characteristics and how they relate to biology. So for size and size exclusion or size and size distribution, um, we can use uh, dynamic light scattering, size exclusion columns, uh, multi-angle light scattering, for instance, for surface characteristics like zeta potential, which is charge. Um, we can also look at protein binding uh, using asymmetric field flow uh, fractionation um, and other techniques in which we can fraction by size and then look at each of these individual size fractions. We can look at composition using chromatic graphic techniques, uh, identifying drug that's bound, uh, total, or free within the system. Um, we can look at um, uh, ligand uh, concentrations, for instance, um, for purity. Uh, again, we use a lot of chromatographic techniques to look at the drug impurities, uh, potential lip lipid impurities, and other degradation components, uh, et cetera. For stability, be this uh, shelf life stability or um, forced um, uh, uh, stability studies such as high temperature studies, we also look at these previous um, characterizations in the light of how they change with regard to these storage conditions. Um, for morphology, uh, cryo-TEM uh, is kind of the gold standard. It allows us to look at um, the liposome morphology. We can look at uh, the state of the drug within the liposome, such as it, is it crystalline. We can look at size distribution, et cetera. So this is a very powerful technique. Um, it's a little bit uh, logistically difficult. Uh, it doesn't always work with all materials, but uh, when it does, it can yield a lot of information. Batch-to-batch -batch consistency is also an issue. Um, it's very important that lot-to-lot -lot the material is the same, so you can rely on the previous preclinical data or clinical data um, as you uh, move from lot-to-lot. -lot. 
So assessing what the important characteristics are for determining sameness of batch to batch, such as the critical quality attributes is very important. And lastly, uh, we also look at starting uh, material characterization. So this summary is available in a handout and you can find that on our website right down here if you are interested in uh, what is considered the current state of the art in characterization of these materials. Uh, Jeff Clogston, who heads up our PCC efforts, is on multiple standards organizations, such as ISO and ASTM, and he's pushing a lot of these through as standards uh, in those organizations for best practices. So, as I was going to say, um, why is it that we need to uh, target lipid nanoparticles to tissues? Why can't they just go everywhere within the body? and um, maybe just through the preference or the selectivity of the siRNA or mRNA protein uh, find their application. Well, the problem is most LNPs um, do not go to uh, everywhere in the, in the body. It's uh, mostly uh, dictated by the administration route. So if you give an LNP by intraperitoneal or intravenous administration, it generally goes to liver, as you can see here, for a mRNA LNP, um, but it's also the same for siRNA LNP. Um, if you give it by a non um, directly systemic route, sub Q, IM, intradermal, primarily you'll see uptake into lymph nodes and within those lymph nodes, antigen presenting cells. Now, this is a great route of application, a route of um, uh, tissue uptake for. Um, vaccine application, of course, because you're getting uptake into the AP APCs. Also, you're getting uptake into lymph nodes that are rich in immune cells like B cells and T cells. But for other applications, obviously, that might not be ideal. So how does this happen? What's the mechanism of action of these siRNA and mRNA L LNPs? Um, for an IV-injected siRNA LNP, Initially, what happens is you get loss of this uh, uh, peptide stealth coating, okay? And this is because these peptides, or these uh, pegylated, I should say, stealth coating, and it's because these peg um, surface coatings are held very loosely to the bilayer by very small lipids, okay? So they're easily released from the bilayer. Upon their release, uh, apoprotein E can then bind to this uh, lipid bilayer and then there is uptake uh, by hepatocytes, uh, specifically by the low-density lipoprotein receptor. This leads to uptake into endosome with a reduced pH, just like when we made these ionizable LNPs at the reduced pH, you're getting uh, protonation of those uh, cationic groups again, which then interact with the negatively charged uh, phosphates, and this leads to disruption of endosome, release of the siRNA, um, association with the RNA-induced silencing complex, and ultimately uh, knockdown of the mRNA of interest, as is in the case with the translirotin um, siRNA concept for Ampatra. Okay, so in the case of mRNA vaccines, following intramuscular injection, you get uptake into muscle cells, but also into lymph node and APCs. Uh, within the somatic uh, muscle cells, you get uh, production or translation of the mRNA to the spike protein, which is broken down by proteasome, to release the epitopes, which are then expressed on MHC class one molecules and presented to uh, CD, uh, CD8 uh, T cells. Um, Alternately, um, you can get uptake of the spike protein to B cells and expression through uh, CD class 2 um, uh, to present to CD4 T cells. And the same is true for uh, the antigen presenting cells, which in this case, the uh, protein is chewed up in lysosome and then expressed. But in any event, you know, this is the mechanism um, by which um, the mRNA vaccines function. Now, what we're trying to do is get an increase into uptake into the APC cells, okay, to get a more potent response as opposed to distribution throughout all the body, body's uh, cells, primarily muscle at the site of injection, but then 
eventually there is systemic distribution and distribution to uh, other cell types. So we feel that if we can, um, if we can actually increase that specificity, uh, we can have a more potent vaccine. So recently we um, conducted a survey in the literature of all the ongoing research for tissue targeted LNP strategies. And that was published last year in uh, pharmaceuticals. What we found was most of the research most of the research currently is for targeting of immune cells and liver. Not surprising, as I just said, that's low hanging fruit. That's where the LNPs normally go to anyway. Um, but in addition to immune cells and liver, we saw uh, lung and tumor were also the next targeted organs. And the way that these were targeted, uh, the number one way was actually by LNP composition. So this is just changing the charge size, lipid composition and peg density. And in doing so, you can get selectivity of uptake into various tissues. It's obviously easier than going through conjugative chemistry um, by attaching ligands to the LNPs. So alternately, attaching ligands, uh, such as antibodies, uh, receptor ligands, like aptamer sugars and peptides. Um, you can even identify new uh, ligands using phage display libraries for like peptides uh, that can identify novel targeting ligands. Um, these are all gonna be more involved than lipid composition because you have to go through conjugative chemistry. You have to be concerned about the ligand density on the surface. Do you want how, what percentage do you want to get the best uptake? Sometimes if it's too crowded, that decreases uptake versus you want uh, avidity. So an increase in association with receptors, which would lead to you wanting an increase in the percentage of those uh, ligands on the surface. So that can be very complicated. The chemistry can be complicated. Uh, most of these are administered IV unless uh, targeting lip node or dendritic cells, of course, and then um, these various uh, IMID and sub Q routes. So to attach a ligand, um, it's almost exclusively done by attaching ligands to that uh, PEG surface coating. Okay, and this involves both modification of the PEG with a functional group as well as modification of the ligands quite often uh, to accept that functional group using high yield chemistries, of which there are many. Some of these are characterized as click chemistry, but not all click chemistry being, being very high yield, very simple chemistries um, that would lend themselves to uh, scale up. So just to touch on some of the research that we have going on, um, we've been working with Georgetown uh, on a collaboration for a number of years to develop a cholecystokinin targeted gastrin siRNA nanoparticle for treatment of pancreatic cancer. This is a somewhat different platform than an LNP, but um, similar in the way that uh, the uh, nucleic acid associates with the platform. In this case, we're using a PEG um, polylysine polymer. Uh, with the cationic charge on the polylysine to condense the nucleic acid to form a polyplex micelle. As you can see here, we have the gastrin 10 amino acid peptide ligand to the cholecystokinin uh, B receptor, um, which allows targeting of the pancreatic cancer since cholecystokinin B receptor is upregulated not only on pancreatic cancer, but on early pre-pancreatic cancer, and I'm gonna to touch on that in a second as well. By fluorescently labeling polyplex, we showed that there was um, rapid accumulation within uh, pancreatic cancer xenografts. We saw no uptake in uh, uh, other tissues, so it was very selective, and we saw no uptake into uh, tumors that did not express the CCKB receptor. By knockdown of gastrin using the gastrin siRNA in the polyplex, we reduced the tumor size, in this case, tumor weight. We decreased uh, tumor um, proliferation. And most importantly, we decreased the metastasis of this tumor in this model, um, basically eliminating metastasis. Along with this, we saw a dramatic decrease in the extracellular matrix with a massive decrease in fibrosis. So one of the reasons that pancreatic cancer um, 
is not especially treatable with small molecules or um, immunomodulators is that this dense um, extracellular matrix made up of collagen uh, does not allow for diffusion of small molecules in as well as uh, um, the uh, um, uptake of immune cells. Okay, so we found this to be a quite dramatic result and that we were decreasing this, this fibrous, uh, fibrous um, extracellular matrix that in combination with chemotherapeutics or immune checkpoint inhibitors might have some advantages. Next, we wanted to see using the same platform, again, in collaboration with Georgetown, could we actually halt progression of pancreatic cancer in a transgenic model? And so what we did here is use a mutant KRAS siRNA, also targeted to CCK as before, um, using the, uh, the gastrin ligand, um, fluorescently labeling the uh, micelle. Again, we saw rapid accumulation within the very early non-cancerous lesions in the pancreas. Um, these are called uh, pancreatic intraepithelial neopla neoplasia, um, or uh, cancer in situ. And um, we were able to, uh, as I said, accumulate within these early lesions and identify the lesions. And since uh, uptake was uh, corresponded with the severity or grading of the lesion, um, the uptake also was a way of measuring how advanced this early stage of uh, precancer was. Um, in addition to imaging, uh, by knockdown of the mutant KRAS, we saw a dramatic decrease in the grades of pancreatic um, early cancer, the panins, um, as you can see here for mutant KRAS in comparison to scrambled and control. And interestingly, we also saw a decrease in um, the immunosuppressive M2 macrophage and also an increase in um, you know, um, anti-tumor uh, M1 macrophage. And again, we saw this decrease in, in the fibrosis within the matrix around the tumor. And so we thought this was very promising data. Uh, there's two patents on this technology. Um, this could be considered a theranostic in that we're both diagnosing cancer at the earliest stages, of which now there is no method to uh, to do this, um, we're actually switching from a fluorescence um, imaging to uh, PET imaging, which gives a much stronger signal um, and is more clinically relevant. And of course, uh, we also have the capability to treat the, this early cancer once identified. So we've seen a lot of interest from industry, and it's a really exciting project. Uh, lastly, um, we are collaborating uh, with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute for uh, Sickle Cell Disease. Specifically, we're in collaboration with Dr. Tisdale's group at NHLPI uh, to help develop a hemat hematopoietic stem cell CD177 targeted LNP to deliver CRISPR gene editing tools for um, small cell or sorry, uh, sickle cell disease treatment, which is actually a cure in this case if you're able to uh, genetically modify um, the, um, the hematopoietic stem cells. So sickle cell disease is caused by point mutation in the beta globin gene uh, resulting in vasoocclusion, multi-organ damage, and generally early mortality. Um, LNP-based in vivo um, HSC gene therapy may dramatically reduce the cost and complexity of the current ex vivo um, HSC culture or allograft uh, transplant techniques um, because these are quite in, um, invasive and uh, logistically difficult. Um, in the culture technique, what you're doing is gene addition or, or editing of hematopoietic stem cells from the patient. Uh, you then re-inject those back into the patient with allograft transplant. You're ablating uh, the cells in the body, and then you're transplanting uh, allograft um, hematopoietic stem cells in their place. Only about 10% of the time can you find a match. It's very expensive. But um, if this were to work, this in vivo gene editing technique, it would allow for a very cheap therapy um, for um, uh, sickle cell disease that could be curative and could work in the third world countries as well as 
first world countries. And so it's really exciting. And we've had some recent success, I should say, on targeting this. And lastly, uh, we are assisting the Cancer Immunoprevention Laboratory uh, for uh, mRNA and saRNA LNP vaccines. In addition, we're evaluating APC-targeted LNPs for improvement in the potency and the efficacy of the vaccine. And in doing so, we expect there would be an increase in safety as well. And we've had some early success with this targeting uh, using uh, various ligands uh, to, the, um, to the APC, specifically dendritic cells. And we're just about to go into preclinical studies to evaluate those new targeted um, APCs, uh, APC targeted uh, LMPs. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the folks in the uh, NCL who provide all the data um, that I was discussing today, as well as our collaborators at Georgetown, uh, Dr. Jill Smith, and collaborator at NCI Sipple, uh, the manager of that program. Uh, Jason Marshall, who's been very helpful um, filling in all the immunology side of things that um, uh, I am not as aware of. Uh, so I want to thank these folks, and I can take any questions you might have. Thanks. Yeah, right. Is there a, is there any concerns? Uh, in vitro and vivo correlation with SARNAs, just trying to understand, is it like the efficacy you get in vitro, is it also being reproduced in vivo? So from what we've seen, um, SARNAs, which are longer lived, right, um, than mRNA, are giving advantages uh, with regard to potency in vivo as well as in vitro. Yeah, we do, we do see a correlation, and that's coming out of SIPL too, actually. Is it the same? Like what you see in vitro, is it vivo is expected as you would, is it as expected in the vivo response? Or you see it is. We, we see a correlation between the two. Yep. There was one question in the chat. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, you indicated that microfluidics was used to create the banana particles. Is the microfluidic platform capable of generating sufficient quantities of the vaccine of interest for clinical studies? So as far as I know, um, even though a lot of this is proprietary, um, at least one of the mRNA vaccines uses microfluidic systems to scale. Yeah. So I would say yes. You had mentioned in your literature survey that the lung was the third most sort of targeted organ. Yeah. Do lipid nanoparticles lend themselves to delivery via inhalation, or are they targeting it via IV or IM administration, that which then goes? Yeah, good point. So both ways. So we have seen uh, where they're targeting from uh, a parenteral administration and also inhalation. And there are reasons for that. You know, um, there is accumulation of LNPs to some degree in lung as well. Um, and following uh, um, intravenous administration, so that is also kind of a low-hanging fruit, if you will. But, um, uh, but yeah, direct inhalation, obviously, that's, a, you know, a potentially a simpler route as well. Yeah. And they do survive fairly well in sort of inhalation preparations, like if you were to... Yeah. Dry powder or something like that. Right. Um, I mean, they they tend to be more complicated systems as far as administration because of um, the nature of lung distribution is so dependent upon uh, many things, but also size, very specific sizes. Yeah. So you can, um, you, you there can be complications with the means to deliver to certain areas of the lung, but in general, you know, as far as Getting it into the lung, obviously, inhalation is the easier way to start off, and then you can worry about how low in the lung and what tissues you get to. And I have a question about I have a comment about that because it is known that, for example, alveolar microphages can, if the nanoparticles are so small, can be taken by alveolar microphages. True. 
So if the lipid nanoparticles are about 200 nanometers or less than that, how could you avoid that? That's the reason why, for example, large porous micropart microparticles were designed a long time ago precisely to avoid the, to be uptaken by, by, by uh, alveolar microphages. Well, at a certain size, you will start trapping in the alveolar uh, capillaries, okay? Just because of the narrow size of the capillaries, you give something around, you know, gets up around two or 300, and you'll start getting accumulation. The other side of it is um, cloved hoofed animals, okay? Be it pig, um, other uh, farm animals, um, some of which are used preclinically, they have a different um, immune system. Uh, and so there will actually be preferential uptake into um, pulmonary alveolar macrophage as opposed to cell in liver. And so that's something to keep in mind because pigs are being used quite often now. And, and so uh, for various um, uh, indications preclinically. And um, for nanoparticles, you can get a dramatic shift in distribution versus liver uh, because of the preferential na nature of the polymorpho polymorphonuclear uh, phagocytic system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much to our speakers, Marina, Punit, and Steve. And, uh, Thank you for the, you know, for all the attendees who, you know, connected virtual and came in person. So we're gonna have uh, the second um, Biotech Connector second quarter in May, May 17th. So stay tuned. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.